Welcome. I'm so happy to be doing this event today. Um, our speaker today is Ian Shapiro, the founder of Tatum Engineering up in, uh, in Ithaca, New York. Ian's green building expertise started with hands-on energy efficiency work and grew into a, a broad analytical understanding of the field. His work is now focused on the immediate practical challenge of electrifying everything. A few years ago, actually I forget, I think it's like four years ago or so, Ian and Frank Chang came out with a book called Green Building Illustrated. And um, I have here a book from, it's like the beginning of time. I'm an architect and it was um, Mr. Chang's book, The Form, Space and Order. It was just, it was like the Bible of architecture. So I was super excited to be able to do the launch of the first volume of the book from this renowned illustrator and Ian Shapiro, who is a wonderful voice in the green building community. Um, Ian was our subject matter expert for the first version of um, Conquering the Energy Code. He told us everything we need to know about one to four family buildings and energy is amazing. He's also written a fantastic book about um, energy audits that has a very long name and I'm not gonna go into it. So what we're gonna do today, Ian's gonna show us some of the new stuff that it has that he's developed for version two and um, tell us about it for about 20, 25 minutes or so. It's, it's some really good, interesting stuff. Then we're gonna chat for a few minutes while you all come up with your questions and then we'll ask him those questions. So let's turn it over to Ian. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ellen and Caitlin. Um, we can jump right into the uh, next slide. So um, I just wanted to say thanks to Urban Green Council. For those of you who don't know, uh, Urban Green is located in Manhattan, a fabulous advocacy, research, training. So one one stop shop for uh, green building uh, work. Great programming and uh, uh, again, thanks for their support. So today we're marking the, the release of the uh, second edition of uh, Green Building Illustrated. And I'm actually gonna talk more about where the field is today and what's changed in the, in the years since the first edition came out. And um, I do want to say what a pleasure it has been working with uh, Frank Ching uh, Frank's work is, is so broad, and all of you who are architects are, are familiar with his work, but it's so exciting to introduce his work to those of us who are not architects, uh, engineers, uh, energy consultants, policy people. Um, if you're not familiar with Frank's work, please do yourself a favor and, and look at some of his other books on construction detailing, on structures, interior design, the theory of architecture. And Frank's work is not only broad, it's, it's so deep. I believe he has really captured the essence of conveying information visually and conveying technical information. And for, for green buildings, which is its own thing, it's so helpful to be illustrating principles like the continuity of insulation, uh, building shape, uh, the importance of where unheated spaces go, basements, attics, um, stairwells. To convey this information visually takes it to a whole deeper level. So uh, just so I, I said it in 2014, I'll say it again. Uh, Frank is a national treasure, just uh, the most unusual author and illustrator, and we're we're very lucky that uh, we're very lucky to have him and 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 for his work on this book. Uh, next slide. What has changed since 2014? You know, I would suggest that green buildings are at a crossroads. The field is uh, just over 20 years old. It was really launched with the LEED uh, rating system, certification system. And it was launched as, as an idea of what we could do, what we could do to make buildings greener. And I think today we've moved 
moved into a time where the discussion is about what we must do. The um, urgency of responding to climate change is so great that uh, building design has, has been forever changed. And we are needing to decide what of all of these things that we have defined as green, we absolutely must do. Um, and with COVID this year, there's the issue of providing good indoor uh, environments, good indoor air quality. And that is also not a choice. We're not going to choose to offer that to some people and not to others. And so uh, we're, it's, we're really at a crossroads and it's an important, uh, important change that's happened. Uh, next slide. The exciting news uh, also just in the last few years is that zero energy buildings are coming along faster and in some ways easier than we expected. Uh, we have a new chapter in the book with case studies, and these are some of them. And we've drawn case studies from around the world, um, and we, we describe them in some important metrics. Um, it's, it's happening much easier and much earlier than we expected, and much more affordably. So I was giving a talk in uh, locally here in Ithaca, and I got up and I, I said to the, the audience, I'm so excited. I believe we have at least five zero energy buildings in the county. And I was giving examples. And a contractor raised his hand and he said, you know, I don't think we have five. We must have at least 15 because I've built 10 myself. And so um, it's happening just so much more, so much faster than we expected. Uh, next slide. Changes to sites. So this is the site on which we locate buildings. The big development is electric vehicles and electric vehicle chargers. So uh, six years ago, there were few plug-in electric vehicles. And today there's a big demand for charging. And we want to do it right. We want to do it carefully. We want to uh, people not tripping over cords. And so, um, uh, big new development in uh, site design. Next slide. Solar's arrival. In the last few years, the cost of solar has dropped by 70%. And that's before incentives, so government incentives, utility incentives. Affordable and reliable. LED lighting, a transformation, total transformation to lighting, artificial lighting. Reliable, it lasts much longer than uh, incandescent or fluorescent lighting. And affordable, you, you can buy these lamps barely for much more than we used to pay for the cheap incandescent lights. And uh, able, we're able to control them. So the next slide is the controls. Um, lighting control, more reliable motion sensors. So you might remember the old motion sensors where you'd come into a room and the lights would come on and then you'd sit down at your desk and the lights would go off and you needed to wave your arms. Uh, they've just become much more reliable. We're seeing them used uh, almost universally indoors and outdoors. And a big development is the use of shorter off delays. So when you come into a space, the light comes on. But when you leave the space, the light stays on, right? And we used to leave the light on for 20 or 30 minutes. But today we've shortened that. And that delivers energy savings that are much, much greater. The combination of motion sensors and LED lighting, we're talking about saving 90% of the power that we used to use for for artificial lighting. And I'll mention that uh, uh, recently I went to our local hospital, I was visiting a friend and it was at night and I, I parked my car and I'm going into the hospital and the, the, the lights are turning on in front of me as, as I'm going in. And I said, this is unreal. This is a hospital and they feel comfortable enough with 
motion sensors that they're letting people who might be ill uh, use uh, motion sensors to enter the hospital. So then I said, I wonder how long they're keeping them on. So I looked back and I, I, I started my stopwatch and within a minute, those lights had turned off. So this just goes to show if they can do it in a hospital, I think uh, we can do this everywhere. So for outdoor lighting, we want to keep the lights off during the day with a photo sensor and then a motion sensor at night. And again, deliver uh, fabulous energy savings. Less fossil fuels. If we are going to slow and stop and reverse climate change, we have to stop using fossil fuels, that's oil, natural gas. In buildings, it's mainly for space heating. And so we're moving to a device called a heat pump, and this is happening rapidly and successfully. Uh, next slide, including for hot water. So here's a heat pump water heater on the right. These have become so popular. We have five or 10 manufacturers. You can pick them up at Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, and they, they deliver savings of uh, uh, over 50%. Next slide. Water efficiency. So here uh, you see the um, original book and the federal requirement for how efficient shower heads need to be and urinals and faucets. And then we have the EPA water sense requirement in the right column, which is a high efficiency green requirement. Well, three years ago, the state of New York passed a law that said, we're going to require the EPA water sense requirement. And it happened so quietly, none of us even knew about it. It was about a year later that somebody mentioned to me, did you know that we now have uh, water sense requirements in New York State? So this is an example of how green buildings are moving from the voluntary elective uh, certification approach, the original approach, which was voluntary, how it's moving into uh, mandatory. Uh, successfully, and this is the crossroads that we're at. Next slide. Changes to materials. Uh, we're seeing fabulous developments, in insulation and other materials. Cross laminated timber, this is wood that's been uh, assembled in a way as to be very strong. So we're seeing high rise buildings over 30 stories tall being structurally built out of wood. We have new refrigerants that have not only a low impact on uh, the ozone layer, but also if they leak, they have less impact on uh, global warming. We would really like to see this refrigerant 32 adopted in the US. It's used almost universally overseas and it has not been adopted here in the US yet. It has a low flammability, very successfully used uh, in Japan and overseas. We'd like to see it used here. The refrigerant we're using has a slightly high uh, global warming potential if it leaks. So, uh, and we're seeing transparency with materials. There are these environmental product declarations. We now know what is in the materials that go into our buildings and we can, we can look at them with a variety of metrics for um, chemical content and the like. So a lot of transparency with material. Okay, so I've talked about changes over the last few years. Now, where are we today and where are we headed? Um, next slide. Uh, stuck, I'm trying to guess. <laughs> okay. Fossil fuel bans. Fossil fuel bans are coming. For some people, they're already here. The city of San Francisco just announced a fossil fuel ban. I think Portland has. Our city uh, and town of Ithaca are considering a fossil fuel ban for buildings uh, starting in a few years. It's, it's coming. So what does it mean? It means the ends of, end of boilers and furnaces you know, devices that heat buildings uh, with fossil fuels. 
but it also likely means the end of chillers. And chillers are air conditioners used for large buildings, um, all high rises. And it's the end of chillers. We are going to be moving to these heat pumps. And the heat pumps look different and they have different characteristics. I think we're going to see room by room heat pumps. Uh, we have a few already on the market with mixed success. I think we will see uh, heat pumps that you can maybe even put in the window or certainly hang on the wall. We will see uh, getting a little more technical for the engineers among you. I think we will see heat pump coils and air handlers so that we can serve large auditoriums, uh, conference centers, large spaces. I think high rise buildings are going to see these recessed balconies that's shown in the illustration. Uh, VRF is a variable refrigerant flow. It's a type of large heat pump. We need a place to put these and we, we can put them on the roof, we can put them on the ground, but in a high rise building, um, we, it's, it, it's too, too, too tall. So we will start doing for sure what is already done overseas. And we've seen this in, uh, I've seen it in uh, Japan. I've seen it in the Middle East. I've seen it in Europe. We will see these balconies, they're recessed balconies covered with louvers and then uh, heat pumps nicely concealed serving each floor. So that's coming for sure. And then we'll see heat pumps for other applications, uh, hot water and ventilation. We will see heat pumps without any backup heat. Uh, there's been a residual concern from about 30 years ago that heat pumps um, don't work in cold climates. And, and, and that, that is no longer the case. So we have a uh, new building. I can see it right from here. It's across the street from my office. It's about 12 apartments. And I inspected the building uh, last year. Uh, and it's all heat pumps. And there's no backup heat. And we're in Ithaca. Okay, so it's... Uh, it's upstate New York. It's cold here in the winter. And I went over, we were, I was inspecting the building for the, and I was expecting the heat pumps for the state. And I went in and I met some of the, the tenants. And I said, you know, these heat pumps, how, how do they work for you? They said, we love them. It's heat in the, heat in the winter and cool in the summer. I said, how, how did you do last winter? It was a very cold winter. And every single tenant said it was Toasty warm, toasty warm. So for this, for, for, uh, for us engineers using heat pumps without backup heat, without fossil fuels, without electric resistance is a big development. And um, that has arrived. Uh, next slide. figuring out which heat pumps to use. There's different kinds of heat pumps. There's heat pumps, uh, ground source heat pumps. We used to call them geothermal. Uh, there's uh, the split heat pumps. Uh, you see them on the walls. There's the larger uh, VRF heat pumps I mentioned. There's rooftop heat pumps. Uh, you might see them on a McDonald's or uh, retail. And then packaged terminal heat pumps, those go through the wall. Each of these has a different efficiency. Each of them has a different cost. And there's a shakeout happening as we figure out which ones work best, which ones work efficiently, and then which ones work in different building types. So across the top, everything from a small single family home to a high rise building, we're figuring out which are the best heat pumps to use. And, and uh, like I said, there's something of a shakeout happening. Next slide. What goals and standards to use? We have many voluntary standards. Um, we kind of started with LEED. LEED is, uh, is a wonderful certification system and, and maybe the largest for green buildings. 
Passive House is a European standard. It has gained some traction with, it, with a focus on energy use. Energy Star, also energy use. Both of those two have some attention given to indoor air quality. Architecture 2030, another voluntary standard. And then we're starting to see net zero standards. But we don't have a national, we don't have good harmony yet on a national standard. So I think that that's, this, this is going to happen. There's going to be a, a shakeout happening with these voluntary standards. And then we'll see this movement to mandatory as well. Next slide. I think we'll see changes to energy charges. We might see carbon-based um, charges in the future. I think we may see changes to electric demand charges. So this is for uh, large commercial buildings, demand charges of peak demand. And um, I, I think there's going to be changes coming uh, in the way we are, we pay for our energy. Next slide. Zero energy buildings, I said, it's so exciting. They've, they've really arrived. And I think what we're going to see in the future, we're going to see some work around storing energy. And that'll both be batteries, electric energy, but it may also be storing heat um, that we captured during the day or, or maybe even that we capture in the summer, use in the winter. Um, this is going to come slowly. I think we have another 10 years until we see energy storage taking off. Harmonized standards, especially around zero energy, the definition of zero energy, how a building can use remote solar. So solar energy that's produced on a farm, maybe in a, an adjacent county and how that's best credited. Um, more clarity on process loads, plug and process loads. It's things like elevators, escalators, uh, industrial uses of energy. We have kind of uh, uh, commercial kitchens, restaurants. We've kind of been uh, punting. We've been putting that off. But I think that we will get around to dealing with these uh, plug loads and process loads. And then zero energy for taller buildings. Uh, today we can serve maybe a three, four, five, six story buildings with solar energy on site up on the roof or, or on the ground. It's getting harder once we get above six or seven stories, then we have, we really are relying on remote energy, remote solar energy. But maybe we'll find ways to put it, layer it up on the roof or put it on the wall. So I think we'll see uh, these, dev uh, these uh, changes, developments with zero energy buildings. Uh, next slide. Lighting is becoming so efficient. I mentioned earlier, 90% less, uh, less energy use, uh, is, is, is within reach. And as artificial lighting becomes if so efficient, I am expecting the end of what we call daylight harvesting, daylighting, daylighting, for purposes of saving energy not for natural light. We need and we love natural light and we deserve it. But there has been an effort to use natural light to light buildings. And, um, and doing so requires a certain design. We typically put the uh, glazing, the windows up high. I think that's going to come to an end because the thermal losses, which means the, the heating that's required because of those that glazing is, is offsetting any gains from daylight. Again, it doesn't mean that we won't have windows for natural light to and, and for views. But I think we will spend some, we'll give some focus to how much we need, what's the right amount and in which spaces. I think the focus will be on regularly occupied spaces, that is offices, um, uh, homes, living rooms, 
those will be the spaces that we're going to concentrate on for natural light and for views and, and spaces that are not regularly occupied. That's stairwells, corridors, utility rooms. We're going to think very hard about uh, glazing in those spaces. Next slide. Materials. Uh, there's an emerging field called biomimicry. We've added some material on biomimicry to this book. Biomimicry is using inspiration from nature. And it really, it's an umbrella term. And they, we also use the term biomimetics. But it's an umbrella term because it covers a few things. One is it covers what we call biophilia, which is our love and connection to nature. So we're trying to build that into buildings to offer that connection. It covers biomorphic design, which is the inspiration of natural shapes and our love of natural shapes. And then finally, it covers function. And uh, I think this is such an inspiring young field. I think that we're going to see more work in this area and in, and in function. There is potential for um, ventilation. There's potential for reducing heat loss. So um, biomimicry, I think uh, you'll hear more about it. Design for deconstruction. We're very concerned about construction waste at the end of life of a building. So I think we'll be seeing more uh, screw fasteners, less adhesives possibly. A focus on embodied carbon, that means how much energy is used to make materials. Once we get energy use in the building under control with zero energy buildings for heating, lighting, we need to turn our attention to embodied energy. How much energy goes into making materials? Some materials like concrete use more energy to make them and transport them. And uh, so I think we'll be seeing more wood I, I mentioned the uh, laminated timber, more steel, which is recyclable, and we'll see less concrete, and we, we already are. Next slide. Plug and process loads, I mentioned it. It's something of a final frontier. And I think that um, we offer a few different strategies to reduce plug and process loads, to reduce them during periods when buildings are not occupied and reduce them also when buildings are occupied. And there's a few different strategies. This is a challenge. This is not an easy um, final frontier. Next slide. I think we'll be paying more attention to quality in construction. And this, you know, quality is a field that really came out of manufacturing where we were and we're, we do manufacture thousands of cars and thousands of machines. Um, buildings are different because we make them in smaller quantities. But the field and the, the discipline of quality is, is important. And I think it's arriving with better inspections, with better uh, commissioning of buildings. And we've, uh, we've offered this acronym in the book uh, called VITAL to inspect for voids where insulation is missing, the type and thickness of insulation, thermal bridging, which is where insulation is penetrated and air leakage. So uh, just a little acronym to support quality. And then I've got a few examples from the book just to give you a taste of some of what we've done. Uh, we have a section on the greenest location for stairwells in buildings. So think of this as a floor plan of a high rise building, uh, two stairwells, very typical. And we've shown a few options for how and where to locate the uh, stairwells and the associated energy use, the associated construction cost, and then the temperature in the stairwell. These are unheated stairwells and, and we advocate strongly for not heating stairwells. You can save 10% uh, or more of a building's heat if you, if you don't heat them. 
But if you look at these, uh, the, the thicker lines is where the insulation are, and the thinner lines are, are walls that are not insulated. And if you look at the top example here, the, the energy use is actually high, even though the stairwell is insulated. And it's high because the area that's insulated is high. And then look at the bottom sketch. We've insulated just that small section as you enter the stairwell. And that's the lowest, lowest energy. So that's the most efficient placement of a stairwell. And we've saved on construction cost. And this illustrates a principle that we propose in the building, which we're, it's, it's getting a little technical, but we're, it's, uh, we call it heat throttling. And so we want to always insulate the smallest surface and that prevents heat, heat loss. And uh, so it reduces energy use, reduces energy cost, and it reduces construction cost. And then if you, uh, was, if you flip uh, slowly through the next few slides, you'll see more examples of stairwells and where you can locate them inside the building in corners. And, um, and again, the associated energy cost, construction cost. If you're designing the most efficient building, you can choose the one with the lowest energy cost. If you're trying to find some kind of a compromise, between stairwell temperature and uh, energy use. Uh, again, there's examples given. And then with a theory of heat loss throttling and how you can use that with designing attics, basements, crawl spaces, all these unheated spaces, it's the same principle. Uh, next slide. Um, we introduce a metric, a new metric in the book called building shape efficiency. Uh, building shape impacts their heating and cooling energy use, and it also impacts the construction cost. And uh, the shape efficiency starts at 0%, goes up to 100%. It can even be slightly above 100%. And these are three examples of buildings. They're case studies from the book with, with one of them that in my eyes has a stunning shape. It uh, comes in at 100% shape efficiency. And then other examples of also attractive buildings with a lower shape efficiency. Generally speaking, a higher shape efficiency means a simpler shape, but it doesn't necessarily mean sacrificing aesthetics and, um, and I don't specifically advocate for simpler shapes. I think it's just a good tool to have in your toolbox uh, for architects and engineers in discussions, with building owners. You can offer this up as a way to reduce heating and cooling use and reduce construction costs. And uh, a building that has a shape efficiency of 100% uh, uses half the energy for heating and cooling than one that has a shape efficiency of 50%. So again, another tool for the toolbox. And I would ask you all, architects and uh, engineers, to find out the shape efficiency of a building that you're working on now. I think you'll, it'll help you to orient yourself. And then finally, some other new topics in the second edition. We go, we have a section on material physics, properties of materials, biomimicry, as I mentioned, interior microclimates where some parts of, of buildings can um, be naturally hotter and colder and how you can control that. And then a section on life cycle costing. There's lots of new things and uh, trying to reflect where, where the industry is going. I think that's it. Next slide. Uh, thanks again to uh, our, my co-author, Frank Ching, Urban Green, Alan Caitlin, and John at Wiley, the publisher. Callie Schulte really advocated for this book and shepherded it um, beautifully. Luna Oiwa, wonderful student intern who did much of the research for the second edition. Florence Beve, who was our designer on the first edition and helped me prepare concept sketches for Frank. 
I think Florence may be on the call. And then my family, uh, so, so supportive. Uh, Dahlia, my wife, and my three daughters, Shoshana, Tamar, and Noah, to whom I go running with uh, uh, all my concerns. Tamar and Noah also helped with research on the case studies and Noah on the uh, maps, climate maps and things. So very, very great. I think that's it. I'm gonna wish my brother Jay happy birthday and uh, invite Ellen to jump on and we can go into questions. Hi Ian, that was, that was great. I mean, I even got a chance to look at a, um, an earlier version of those chapters and I, I always learn something from you. I, this was fantastic. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask just one question and then there, there's already a couple of good questions and I there's another one. I expect a lot of good questions, so I don't want to take up too much time with my own. One thing I want to ask you about, um, look, it's really hard for folks to understand the holistic nature of you know, energy efficiency and how it affects, you know, buildings and, and whatnot. How on earth are we going to convey carbon, which is even less tangible in the context of energy? as the building, you know, energy codes are moving towards net zero carbon and whatnot. What do you see as that transition? How are you going to get folks to understand energy to carbon? You know, I think people see energy as, as their utility bill. I, we, we don't have people coming up to you and say, I got charged a thousand kilowatt hours last month. I got charged $300 and I'm upset about it. Um, everything gets translated into dollars. And I think so, I, I think that um, if and when we go to carbon pricing, they will still be talking about the dollars they spent last month. And um, I, I think it can also be done through science communication. You know, it's a great emerging field where you talk about you used as much energy in your house last year as five cars on the road. So I think we'll see a combination of science communication and and uh, and it's just your utility bill, what you're spending. So. Okay, no, that's, those are those are good answers. It's the thing that I sort of, I'm like, I, you know, I'm not sure what direction to go on this and it's it's been keeping me up at night. All right, we're gonna start with the question. So Daniel Rosen asks if um, material in rubble dumps, so bricks, concrete, asphalt, can that be reused after it's ground up? There's so much of it and could, could you know, with shame for that to go to waste. You, you know, I, I think uh, possible. Um, it's, 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 it's easier to separate stuff out and process it first to, to, be, to be going to retrieve things is hard. But I'm speaking when it comes to this as a lay person. You know, I am a mechanical engineer and my, um, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm an energy person, I, and I've given my best when it comes to material and waste and things like that. It's not, it's not my first area of expertise. Fair enough. Although I, I do wonder the, the deconstruction piece of your book. I'm sure you talk to experts about that. Mm -hmm. And um, I know there's some where, where cities have markets for those materials. That stuff takes off. But I'm wondering what is are there other demand drivers for building deconstruction because the market for that will be so many years later that it's hard to see the connection for why a contractor would change the way they build, you know? So here again, I think probably many of these things won't happen without some form of mandates. So uh, we're talking building building code. Um, here in Ithaca, Ithaca is a progressive town. When I look to green building activity, I look to New York City, um, which is really uh, to be commended with um, loc local on 84, local on uh, 87, local on 97. Those are all for existing buildings. And now they're adopting uh, uh, an excellent, excellent energy code. So I look to New York City and then I look, I look to Ithaca as examples of big, big city, small city. And we have some deconstruction activity already happening in Ithaca. It's just getting started, but it's it's using existing buildings with, that, that are not that 100 years old. They were not designed to be deconstructed and they have successfully deconstructed and reused them. So I think there's a lot we can use even with existing buildings. And, uh, 
you know, I, I think also just appealing to people. And in many cases, um, in many cases, mechanical fasteners like screws you know, are, are as good and as affordable like we, um, as, as adhesives and things like that. So, um, and, and unfinished surfaces, you know, unfinished concrete surfaces, we've seen it very nicely used. You're saving construction costs. And um, so I think some of these things will happen naturally. I, I'm very interested in this issue of affordability because we have historically for the last 20 years, we've kind of assumed that green buildings cost more and suddenly we see that green buildings don't need to cost more. You know, a heat pump, heat pumps for sure, for sure, I guarantee you, I promise you, they will within two or three years, they will be way, way more affordable than furnaces and boilers, guarantee you, promise you. And um, so, so we're seeing a trend towards affordability with green buildings um, that is going to knock our socks off. Um, I'm going to tell another just a quick anecdote. I, I want to make sure we've got enough time. I only see two or three more questions. How are we doing for time? If we have a pile of questions. We're good. Tell, we, we, tell us the so, story. <laughs> I'm going to tell a kind of political story, but I, this, I, I'm not going to say what side of the political spectrum I'm on. But we had protests here two months ago, and the protests in, in Ithaca were pro-Trump protests. We also had anti-Trump protests. But the organizer of our local pro-Trump protests is a developer. And it's a developer. He's a developer I know. Well, this developer has put up hundreds of apartments in recent years, and every single one has a heat pump. He is sold on heat pumps and he's sold on heat pumps, not because he's an environmentalist. You know, he, he, he's, he's told me he loves them. It's good comfort and it's very affordable. And so uh, again, we're seeing changes that I think are, we, we didn't expect with things being, being adopted faster than we, we expect. Yeah, so I have, I have a question in the, that was in the chat that's a segue from um, from the last one. Someone who's working on, this is from uh, Amelia La Dolce, who's uh, working on a net zero energy building. And the builder and architect are pushing for uh, concrete floors with radiant heating. And they like the idea of you know polishing the concrete, but um, uncomfortable with the carbon footprint of the concrete. So what do you think? Um. You know, you don't need much concrete for radiant floor. It's just a topping slab, little topping slab, and you're you're good. It doesn't need to be eight inches of concrete. So I think I'm okay with it. Now you need to ask themselves how they'll do air conditioning, because if they're going to do air conditioning, then they might be just wanting to use a, a heat pump for that. They could use a heat pump for the radiant floor, and it'll be pretty efficient. And the, the nice thing about radiant floor is it's super comfortable. Yeah. So um, I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm good with it. Right. And Caitlin, when Caitlin comes back on at the end, she'll, she's going to tell us hopefully approximately when we're going to have an event about um, lower carbon concrete, because there's a, a lot happening in that world as well. And I think in a few years, it's going to be a whole different landscape on that as well. Um, so what are your thoughts on the potential for nodal interbuilding collaboration, and I'll admit I don't actually know what that is, um, in future planning and development. For example, buildings exchanging thermal energy with each other and or district supply. Um, district heating is very common in uh, Northern Europe, very common in Europe in general. Um, it's very, very common on college campuses in the US. Um, Many, most campuses have a district heating system. They have a heating plant, it's a fossil fuel plant, and then they pipe the heat to the building. So um, there are some benefits. There are some benefits. There, um, there's talk about doing this with geothermal heat pumps. And in fact, Cornell, Cornell's doing two things. They're looking at deep, deep earth 
uh, direct heat, extracting heat from several miles down and using that with their district heating system and then supplementing it with heat pumps. Um, so I think there's a place for it. There's absolutely a place for it. New construction? Do you think we're going to see more of that in, in new new campuses, new buildings? I think we, and oh, in new buildings, I think we will. I've, I've heard people kicking around a central geothermal. Okay. Um, the, you do have heat losses between buildings, you know, and, and, and that's kind of too bad. I think Cornell is running about 20% losses just I mean, it's melting the snow and the roads and stuff. Um, so I, I have a little concern about the um, losses, but okay. I, I think there's a place for it, yeah. Okay, Here's a, this is a question um, in your wheelhouse um, about VRF. And the question is, will VRF require a lot more refrigerant in a building? And what's your take on the environmental and safety impact of that? Uh, VRF, so, uh, VRF is used in two different ways. It, it stands for variable refrigerant flow. Some people only use it for the large commercial equipment. Some people use it for all the large and the residential. So I'm gonna assume that this is for both. Uh, we just did a study that says for large buildings, it uses a lot of refrigerant. So where possible, I have a preference like in hotels and apartment buildings, I have a preference to be using the smaller stuff because it uses less refrigerant. That refrigerant is, is harmful to the um, to global warming if it leaks. Right. So we need, um, if there are leaks, there's still a great net benefit to carbon emissions, to using heat pumps. And so I still advocate for them. I don't like the leaks. I would like to limit the leaks. So, um, so we're 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 promoting uh, leak prevention standards. I'll share some of our information. Maybe you can fit it into some of your training. Um, I think we'll see stronger standards around leak prevention if they're designed well. They will rarely leak. Uh, a refrigerator in your uh, in your kitchen is, is a type of a heat pump and it very rarely leaks. So uh, if designed and manufactured and installed correctly, I think we can reduce leaks and we need to reduce leaks. I'd like to also see us changing to refrigerants that don't harm the environment. The fact is today refrigerants uh, do have a small impact and we need to, uh, we need to give it attention. Okay, so I have a great question from Bob Fishman, but it's a little bit of a long question. So are you ready? <laughs> so, well, great presentation, I agree. Thank you for that. Um, so this is a question about existing buildings, retrofits. It, I actually had, had a list of questions about retrofits as well, particularly um, greening existing buildings in the COVID and soon to be hopefully post COVID era. So what energy management strategies do you see to address the changing occupancy of buildings? That's gonna be much more variable than, you know, than in the before times. And um, how do you think building operators will be able to manage the greater air filtration needs and increased airflow and change requirements that um, will increase static pressure with systems designed to operate under, you know, less stringent parameters? Um, COVID has changed everything as well. Um, I never thought I would see you know, our field on the front page of the New York Times um, <laughs> day after day. And so um, I think we'll be doing, we'll be doing more work with indoor air quality. I think we'll be using three, all three fundamental strategies. One is controlling the source. So we will probably be taking people's temperatures as they come into building and trying to keep sick building, sick uh, people out. So that's the source. Um, in our office building, uh, where I'm sitting now, we now have a requirement, no more than one person per office. Again, we're controlling the source. When you're walking around the building, we have a requirement that you wear a mask. We're controlling the source. So controlling the source is the first strategy. Second strategy is uh, filtration. And we will see higher uh, efficiency filters 
I don't think it dramatically. I think we can uh, we can get by with filters that don't change the pressures too too much uh, successfully. Um, and then filter and then uh, ventilation. So we'll be bringing more outside air into buildings, which means higher energy use. And we'll be doing that for more of the day if people are on staggered schedules. So I'm expecting some increase in energy use because of COVID. At the same time, uh, so that's in office buildings, right? And at the same time, we're seeing an increase in energy use at home because more people are at home. So we've got this funny situation where people are spending more time at home, that energy use has gone up. And then in the offices, we've increased ventilation, although the occupancy, the uh, density is uh, of occupancy density is down. Uh, it's having an impact. And um, that's, uh, I think we're still learning what the impact is. Okay. Um, there's a question from Vadim Asadov about what are those brands of affordable heat pumps? And I will say, if you have only one, let's send that to him later. If there's more than one, please let's no, tell No, uh, the affordable heat pumps, um, you know, there's multiple brands. There's, um, I think I'll get in trouble if I start uh, rattling off brands. I've got my favorite brands. I'm happy to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there are wonderful, what I do advocate is using, um, models that are listed in a catalog called the NEEP catalog, N-E-E-P. It's a cold climate heat pump cat, uh, directory. Um, so I strongly recommend those. Um, but I was just speaking, um, it's not the brand that's affordable. The whole installation is affordable as, as uh, with labor and everything, comparing it to fossil fuel. Sure. I want to follow up on, on that. What are the things that when you were researching this book, what were the things that you found were the most misunderstood that would be, you know, the things that need training and for whom? You know, I think historically we have been, um, we've been so excited about daylighting because it kind of seems to make sense. And I've just seen failure after failure after failure. It just doesn't work. People are struggling with the lighting controls and they end up just bypassing the controls and turning the lights on. Um, so I think the role of daylighting and how, how the daylighting savings are offset with heating losses, those things I think are difficult for people to grasp because it, they want the daylight. But what we want to what they want the daylight. Daylighting, sorry, could the daylighting be made more efficient by better insulation or better sensors or whatever it is that's failing? Or is it not even worth it? I take a somewhat um, I take a somewhat strong position that it's it's barely worth it. We should focus on the daylight that we want for ourselves as human beings. We love daylight. We need windows and those are the, we, we should be looking at the comfort and at the views where we don't need it, where we don't need it, is to give people who are outside the building a view of the building at night that makes it look cozy. We don't need that anymore. That's a waste of energy. We don't need to be lighting up our buildings at night. And I would ask architects, please don't make, give your clients renderings of the buildings That's that good. show it looking cozy at night because you don't, that may not be lighting that you need. Um, I've designed buildings myself, stairwells all lit up and I regret it. Um, so it's, it's not just architects, you know. Um, That's a really good point about a culture shift that I would never have thought of that. That's that's a real that's a good one. Um, so the last question I'm going to ask you um, is about advocacy and affordability, because those two things, you know, the affordability of green building. I agree with you that it, green buildings can be less expensive and all that stuff. But the number of people who would agree with that statement are, are you know, on, they're probably on this call right now, right? So how do we get that? 
information out that idea that green building is not just for you know fancy buildings it can be for affordable buildings and what are the things that we would need to advocate for as a community to help move that along no i think that there's specific things you know the things you do to a building that make it more expensive if you add more insulation that makes it more expensive if you put solar on the roof that makes it more expensive that and and i don't think we can deny those things but I think historically that has been the focus of our efforts is more insulation. We like we thought we're gonna we want to make it greener, so let's put more in the building, more insulation, you know, more solar, more. And I think that there is actually a, and and governments like state and federal government will have wanted to encourage us to do green stuff, so they've given us rebates, which is great, and incentives and tax breaks and tax credits for doing more. And I support that. But there is a way of doing less. There's a way of insulating buildings along certain surfaces that costs less. There's a way of um, designing building shapes that cost less. So I think just a, a curiosity, you know, nurturing a curiosity and about, um, we list in the book maybe 50, I don't know, there's a whole list of things. We typically overlight our buildings, like we way overlight them. And if we design two national lighting standards, uh, room by room, it's not hard to do. We, we typically save money on light fixtures. So I think, um, Something about thinking of ourselves as sculpt sculptors, you know, where we're going to, we don't need to add to the building. There's things we can take away and end up with beautiful buildings. But we, um, there's certain strategies that just save money. And, and we, we need to nurture a curiosity about those. Again, maybe in training. That's a great. That's a great place to end, and I, I would urge everyone to get a copy of the, this book. Is it's it's just it's a wonderful way to look at buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. This was wonderful.